my father's place, proclaiming Jesus Christ to the world. Good morning. The title of today's message is clean, clean, clean. That's what he will make you if you will listen to this word. And if you will heed it, that is, act upon it and do it. Oh, he will make you clean. Oh, your sin sick heart will be healed of sin. And you will be all cleaned up inside. And he and the Father and the Spirit will come in and indwell you. And only then will you be his witness here one through whom the world will believe that the Father sent the Son. So you can go to Jeremiah 31, 33. We will also be looking at Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. Clean, clean, clean. This is what he must do in every Christian heart. You will cry that when he does it in you. But first I have to show you that there's no other way to obey him than this. So when Israel was defeated at Ai, the Lord told Joshua that it was because there was sin in the camp, and he tracked it down, and Achan was the, the likely suspect, we'll call it, and Achan confessed that he had sinned. And so that's why they had lost a battle. And so he confessed he had sinned, and as a result, according to what the Lord told Joshua to do, Achan was stoned and burned, and he, his, he and his whole family and everything that he owned. Why? Because sin is contagious. And even though he cleansed Israel of the sinner, Achan, Israel still sinned, so that at the end of his life, in his final address to them, he said to choose that day who they would serve, either the Lord God or the idols and the false gods of the lands. But he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So if he had to say that, then they were already sinning and starting to worship false gods. So it didn't make any difference if he took the sinner and completely obliterated the sinner. Still, the people sinned. And in 1 Kings 1840, Elijah did the challenge and said, you prophets of Baal and Asherah, all 850 of you, Go ahead and build an altar to your false god and tell him to bring down fire on it. And they did, and nothing happened. And he then did it and even had it drenched with water. And the Lord came down, and the people said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah killed all 850 of the prophets of Baal and Asherah. But still the people sinned. Outwardly cleansing the area of Israel by getting rid of these prophets didn't keep more false prophets from coming. And because the people still had sin in their hearts, they went after the false prophets. They'll do it every time. They do it today. There will always be lying prophets no matter if you try to get rid of every single one of them, they will come back. There will be others who come behind them. These are ones who do not know him at all and will lie to you because their father is Satan, who is a liar and the father of lies. And I tell you the truth, you will continue to sin until you ask the Lord to make you clean, clean, clean. He will do it. Now, in the days of Isaiah, in case you're saying, Sue, won't you ever preach anything else? I say no. (laughs) But listen to the people in the days of Isaiah when he was preaching the same thing. Ah, they said, stop speaking to us about holiness. Get out of our way, they said. 
in Isaiah 30, 11. And so the Lord continued to warn and exhort Judah through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and they continued to sin. Even when Judah was carried into captivity, they continued to sin. So it doesn't make any difference. How many lying prophets you kill off, there's still something in the human heart that has to be dealt with. As long as your sin nature is alive and well in your heart, you will find some way to sin because your heart wants to. So is there no cure? Are you doomed? Because no sinner enters heaven, you know. Do not believe those who say it is impossible to stop sinning and that God is blind to your sin, do not believe them. He spoke, even through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, in those days, in the days when they were prophesying for the Lord. He spoke of a promise that he was going to fulfill in the future. In Jeremiah 31, 33, he said, but this is the covenant, that is promise, which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. After those days, I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. It was going to require something in the heart, something had to be done there. They would not obey until he wrote it there. Well, how was he going to do that? Ezekiel explains. Ezekiel 36, 26, A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, within you, my spirit. That would be the Holy Spirit. God is holy. There is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Oh, he was going to put his spirit within them and cause you to walk in my statutes. You won't have any problem following him and obeying him when he's in you. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. That's the King James. Oh my goodness, it just says it so much better than any other version. So he would take the lawlessness out, erase it entirely, and write his law, and he would give them a new heart and a new spirit, his spirit. When he says, I will give you a heart of flesh, some lying prophets will say to you, Oh, that means you still have a sin nature because flesh is equal to the sin nature. Like saying sin nature when you say flesh. Why would he give you something you already have? Tell me. I want to know. That is the cure for a sin sick heart. Him. Him. Obey him. Obey his commandments regarding the spirit. Stay in the city until you are inwardly clothed with power from on high. Power against what? Sin. You have power over sin. Sin no longer rules in your heart. It isn't even there anymore. And Jesus himself in Acts 1, 4 through 5 says, Wait for the promise of the Father the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which in those days he said, you will receive not many days from now. Hallelujah. This was what was going to make their hearts say, clean, clean, clean. This was what was going to make them shout, clean, clean, clean. His law written on their hearts. His spirit in them. Clean, clean, clean. He will not dwell where sin is. So if he comes in, sin goes, and you're clean, clean, clean. There's nothing like it. Ah, 
It was fulfilled at Pentecost in Acts 2. This was, these were future things that were going to happen that were prophesied through Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And Pentecost was, was really, the Lord always used the Old Testament feasts as a type or a foreshadowing of what he was going to do when Jesus Christ came. It was a Jewish feast that was established by the Lord, and it was a solemn celebration of the ingathering of the first of the wheat crop. I remember very, very vividly that in John 4, Jesus speaks of the fields being white for harvest. That is, when the wheat plant is fully developed and ready for harvest, it actually is white at the top. It's ready for harvest. He said the fields are white and ready. Ready for what? First, to be saved from God's wrath. Then to be reconciled to God. And then to obey Jesus Christ. And be filled with the Spirit. Oh, clean, clean, clean. That's what this is all about. When... In Acts 2, the 120 who stayed and waited were baptized. They were entirely changed. If you compare the behavior of the disciples in the Gospels to the disciples starting in the very day that they were filled, it's like night and day. It's like night and day. There's no comparison. They were clueless. Suddenly they knew, suddenly they were filled, suddenly they didn't argue with each other about who was the greatest and wonder what God was talking about through his son. When the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, that first day of Pentecost, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit came to fully and permanently indwell them. That meant their hearts had to be purified again. He will not be where sin is. He refuses to. So he gave gave them his spirit, and they rejoiced. They rejoiced greatly. There were 500, more than 500, according to Paul. Jeff will put the reference up. More than 500 who saw him risen before he ascended. But only 120 obeyed his commandments to stay and wait. And his promise that they would have pure hearts, just as he said through Ezekiel, and just as he said through Jeremiah, that came true in a moment of time. When they were filled, he wouldn't have come in if he hadn't cleansed them. All of that happens at once. He cleanses, then he comes in, all in one moment. Then they were clean, clean, clean. They rejoiced. They rejoiced before. They rejoiced even more greatly when they realized they were clean, clean, clean. And filled with God. And these testimonies, these things God did then, he is still doing now. There was no end to an apostolic age after which we all just have to suffer through and sin and repent and sin again, and repent, and sin again, and repent. There are many false teachers who will tell you, cannot help it, because that was only for the apostolic age. Once the apostles all died off, there's no more. You have to just suffer. But think of it. If that were true, wouldn't we be one's most to be pitied? Think about it. We would be doomed. We would come before him in the day of judgment, and he would say, I never knew you, intimately. No sinner will enter heaven. Why would he just say, well, just for this one time, I'm going to make their hearts pure, but after that, you guys just have to keep on sinning. That's insane. He would never do that. To 
This very day there is a cure for your sin sick heart. I tell you the truth, and I will tell you what happened to a man from England whose first name was Smith. He thought he was filled with the Spirit. And he would tell everybody he was filled with the Spirit. And even when people argued with him saying, no, you're not yet. You should do this. No, he said, I'm filled. I just know it. How many times have I heard that in today's church? Oh, I'm filled. When I was baptized with water, I was filled. There, I'm filled. He had such an argument with one man after going to a church meeting. They went back home on separate sides of the street. <laughs> and so he would tell them, oh, something happened between me and the Lord, and I just know that I'm filled. And suddenly I'm able to really fluently teach and speak the word of God, and so that must be what tongues is all about, he said. But then he heard what was happening at an Episcopal church, and so... He went to that church because he heard that there was all kinds of interesting things he had never heard about before that were happening. And he began to tell them all that he was filled with the Spirit. And the Episcopal vicar's wife took him into a room and laid hands on him. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know what he did? He cried, clean, clean, clean. Oh, the Lord cleaned up his heart. And then the Lord came into fully and permanently and dwell him. Then he was filled and not until. Hallelujah. He knew. He testified. He was just suddenly cleansed and filled with God. And from that point on, the Lord used him powerfully in many ways in ministry, and he preached holiness of heart. Glory to God. Now, I will tell you what happened to me. When I was stricken with unrelenting secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, I rapidly became disabled. And I met someone at the MS support group I began to attend with Jeff. And she began inviting us to church. Well, Jeff was an atheist and I was a new ager, so we were very not interested. But about the fourth time that she asked me, she asked this way. She said, we're having a spaghetti supper at the church in our fellowship hall. And it's really good. Would you guys like to come? Well, the Lord knew Jeff liked spaghetti. <laughs> And so we ended up going, and I came back home afterwards because they were so kind to us. And I said, something is missing in my life, and I think it's God. Jeff hadn't had that revelation yet, and I knew it. He was still an atheist, so I said, but I know that you're an atheist, and so you can just take me to the church and drop me off and bring me back home after but when he figured it out, he would have had about 15 minutes at home between dropping me off and picking me up. So he came. The father started touching us. We would sing the old hymns, the old hymns, the old hymns. And both of us would be weeping, weeping. And so we attended. The father started to touch us. And in January of 2001, a new pastor came to town. I'd never heard anyone preach like him before. He preached with authenticity. He preached so you knew that he lived what he was preaching. You could hear it. You could see it. And in April 2001, he gave us a book called The God Chasers by Tommy Tenney. And I read that, and I found out I could know God intimately. I didn't know anything about clean, clean, clean yet. I just knew I wanted to know him intimately. So sick as I was, I would get on the floor and pray every single day. 
Lord, I want to know you that way every single day. And then, in the midst of all that, the pastor wanted to show me about healing. I'll tell you that story another time, but he began working with me in June of 2001. And September 1st, I was healed in the middle of the night by Jesus Christ. Completely well the next day. Nothing remaining of what I had had. An incurable, irreversible disease. Irreversible tremors that were like this 24-7. Completely. And I was still seeking him because I wasn't seeking him for healing. I was seeking him. You see the difference? And he answered me November 1st, 2001, at 2 in the afternoon, when my neighbor, who was spirit-filled, whom he had placed there, called me up and said, the Lord spoke to me during my devotions and said I should ask you if you would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And <laughs> I knew by that time that was what I had been seeking, this intimacy, and so I said, I will be right over, hung up the phone, told Jeff I'll be back in a little bit. He had no idea what I was doing. I went over, filled with the Spirit, came back through the front door, and Jeff testifies that my whole countenance was changed. I tell you, when the Lord came in, when I was sitting with her and her little two-year-old daughter sitting on a bench, just si silent and quiet, she was never like that. When he came in, my heart cried, clean, clean, clean. I knew he had come in. I knew he was indwelling me fully. I didn't even know all the scriptures. My heart was entirely changed in a moment of time. When I walked through that door and I was lit up with the light of Christ, Jeff saw it. My countenance was changed. And... He began to panic, which was wonderful. Why? Because the Lord showed him a vision. And in it, I was very near to God, and he was back here. And he had asked me what happened when I was, came through the door and looked so different. I said, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. So that was what he knew he needed to be, filled with the Holy Spirit. He didn't know about clean, clean, clean. He repented for everything he could imagine, though, while he was praying for nine, well, it's the ninth day, the Lord answer. So he was praying all in between those times and just repenting for everything he could think of until he finally got to the end of himself and just laid there on the floor in the bedroom in the dark all by himself and said, Lord, I've repented for everything. I just want you, Lord. And he said, I've given up everything, Lord. And the Lord said, what about your wife? What about my wife? Lord, I love her more than anything. And that kept echoing in his brain. I love her more than anything. I love her more than... He loved me more than God. <gasps> so immediately, he said, I give her to you. He had no idea what that meant. He just gave me to him. Next day, pastor came over. It was Wednesday. It was time for our Wednesday Bible study and coffee that he did with us every week. He was discipling us. And the pastor took one look at him and said, you look awful. And he said, I feel awful. And he recounted everything he had been doing. And the pastor got up and went behind Jeff's chair and put his hands on Jeff's shoulders and said some words in tongues. <laughs> Jeff's face lit up and his hands went up and they did not come down for at least 75 minutes. That is a miracle. No one can do that. They were up. He was lit up with the light of God. And we knew God 
was he was with God. God kind of took him up, <laughs> even though he was still there. And he just stayed that way all of that time. We stayed with him and watched him for about 30 minutes and praised. And then we decided to go in to the living room and get our guitars and sing some praise songs. And eventually he kind of wandered out. <laughs> Later on, he asked me, uh, gee, uh, was, I, was I like 10 minutes like that? <laughs> Not exactly. 30 while we watched you, and then another 45 after that. So it was just amazing. And when the Lord came in, he testified that it felt like electricity going through his body to the point where it was really uncomfortable. He was being clean, cleaned, cleaned. And so his heart said, clean, clean, clean after that. Oh, my. Oh, my. God came in. There's nothing like it. I was dead. I was a dead woman walking like what they say in prisons where the death row is. And the death row inmate is being brought out for one reason or another. They'll say, dead man walking. I was a dead woman walking. He was a dead man walking. God came in, clean, clean, clean. And he just filled us with himself. Glory to God. And he's been using us ever since to tell everyone what happened to us. So there was Smith, clean, clean, clean. Me, clean, clean, clean. Jeff, clean, clean, clean. My friend, clean, clean, clean. Oh, my goodness. There is nothing that compares with this experience. Nothing. I, I, I had to laugh just gently, often, because I'd never felt God inside me before. You can literally tell he's in there. And... It was just so joyous. I was filled with joy and expressible and full of glory. Everything that I formerly liked, I was disgusted with. Because he had made me clean, clean, clean. And I didn't like those things anymore. I gave up all that because I had absolutely, it just, it disgusted me. My goodness, clean, clean, clean. So it's for today. And certainly, Peter and Paul and the rest, never in anything that they said did they put a time limit. Oh, this is just for a while we're here. Once we're all gone, that's the end of that. No. They said all kinds of wonderful things. Paul speaks of his clean, clean heart. I'm just going to paraphrase Galatians 2.20. Wow. Ah, I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me, and the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Oh, clean, clean, clean. He spoke of cleansing the whole of Chapter 6 of Romans is all about that. Dead to sin, dead to sin, dead to sin. Glory, clean, 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 glory. Because he won't come in unless he makes you clean, clean, clean. You can't clean yourself up. He has to crucify that's in nature. Then he makes you clean, clean, clean and comes in. And says, ah, I have another God container on the earth through whom I can shine and speak. And we can't stop speaking about what we have seen and heard, just as with Peter and the rest. My goodness. Peter speaks of what happens when the Lord makes a human heart clean, clean, clean. Second Peter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that 
his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge that is intimate knowledge by experiencing the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so by them you may become partakers of the divine nature the divine nature no sin nature in you anymore his nature in you because he's in you the father the son and the spirit permanently and fully indwelling you purifying your hearts he says in acts 59 he made no distinction between us and them that is the house of cornelius a roman centurion for he purified their hearts by faith he purified their hearts oh my goodness then you escape the last part of four of second peter one you escape the corruption that is in the world by lust i'll read verse four of second peter one again for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises they are so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature his nature no longer human nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust oh my goodness you are united with him in character in nature in purpose one with him as jesus prays in john 17 oh my goodness and the great rejoicing peter speaks of that he doesn't place any time limits in this scripture either first peter 1 8 and though you have not seen him you love him and though you do not see him now you but believe in him you rejoice greatly with joy inexpressible and full of glory joy inexpressible clean 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 you will be joyous to such a point that you can't even express the joy that you feel i'll start again with first peter 1 8 and though you have not seen him you love him and though you do not see him now but believe in him you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation the deliverance the deliverance they were already saved now they were delivered the deliverance of your souls because they loved him and therefore obeyed his commandments regarding the spirit peter does not speak of salvation from the wrath of god and reconciliation he's already speaking to believers he's speaking of deliverance from the power of sin deliverance from the power of sin because when he comes in and crucifies your sin nature it's not in you anymore he cleanses your heart purifies your heart and then you say clean 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 and then you're his vessel here you're his container your god container one through whom the world will know that the father sent the son that's your purpose you can't do that as long as you have sin in your heart it's not just for some which i've also heard but for everyone no one is exempted there's no time limit anywhere in this word. Then, that's a cure for the whole issue of the lying prophets. Elijah killed them all, and yet the people still sinned. Joshua killed the one that sinned, and yet the people still sinned. You'll still sin until he takes it out of you. And only he can do it glory to god clean 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 he will make you clean and then he will use you greatly for his kingdom glory to god his kingdom your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven work it in me 
and then I will say, clean, 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 and you'll fill me. Oh, and your kingdom is established in me, Lord, even me, me, the one that was a new ager, Jeff, the one that was an atheist, hallelujah, he will do it. No one is too far from him if they will come to him. You won't be able to stop speaking about what you have seen and heard, and he will give you a mouth and wisdom his, which none of your opponents, and you will fight, face opponents, but none of them will be able to resist or refute the wisdom that he speaks through your mouth. Amen. So I have presented God's truth to you. What will you do with it? Will you reject it like I hear so many Christians do? Will you say, I don't need that, and thereby judge Jesus Christ, saying, I'm sorry, you're wrong about this, Jesus. I don't need to be filled. That was just for apostolic times. That's what my lying pastor tells me. If you reject him, and continue to sin, and you stand before him, you can tell him all the good things you did for him, and he will say, I never, ever, ever knew you. Away from me, you who sin, and his angels will cast you into hell. But if you receive his truth and act upon it, clean, 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 you'll be clean. To be full of God. There'd be no sin in your heart. Power of sin is completely nothing to you. He has made you so you won't go after anything Satan dangles before you. Glory to God. He will dangle. He will tempt you. But you will automatically identify it and you have power over it. You will not sin. So therefore, be made clean, clean, clean. Obey him. This is for always. This was to fulfill the promises that I read to you from the Old Testament. His law written on your heart. God says, I will put my spirit in you, within you. And he does. And it is for today, and it is a command of Jesus Christ. Therefore, repent for disobeying him. And be made clean, clean, clean. Lord Jesus, you do this amazing thing in any human being who will actually believe your words. So may there be those who believe today. I pray in your name. Amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit.